Bible is open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>
that the church could all get together on an island. But really then, if we know how to define it with different words, the question really comes up, what is it? If you have your Bible open, let's go ahead and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to get to reading in verse number 13 and read down to maybe 14. And we also thank God constantly for this, that you, when you receive the word of God, which you have heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but it's what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of all the other churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. For you suffered the same things from your very own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Now let's just stop right there just for a second. The basis is the word of God. I can tell you this that I can walk up to anybody in any culture, in any language, and if we find out that we are both believers in Jesus Christ, there is an instantaneous fellowship that nothing else can bind. You would say, I can do that with a golfer. No, did you know on the PGA Tour, most golfers just barely get along with all the other golfers on the PGA Tour? They have more in common than any other group, small group of people who play in the PGA Tour, about 200 people. That's smaller than most churches, larger than many. But they don't get along, and they have this, in, this incredible common interest. They will go out and play and sometimes win tournaments, and then you hear on the snide what they really feel and think about each other. The Word of God is a common bond that brings people together. But it's not just the Word of God, because for too many people today, and especially if they're reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Word of God instantaneously comes to connote your Bible. Now, I'm not going to say that that's wrong, but don't start there. The Word of God is Jesus Christ himself. If we were to go to John chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning was Jesus, right? But they don't use the word Jesus. They said, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word is God. You might say was God because he's talking to people and reminding them of past tense. But when I talk to you, I want to remind you of future tense. For the word of God was there at the beginning. And he spoke it. Now, I don't know about you, but I can say something and it may or may not happen. Have you ever had that happen? I might say something, and it may or may not happen. I, the only way for me to make sure that what I say happens is if I go do it. And there's a lot of times I don't want to do what I say. I know I need to do this, but I don't feel like doing it today. It'll be there tomorrow. And so when God spoke to the second person of the Trinity, and let me just say, the first person of the Trinity can speak too. Because when Jesus was being baptized, did a voice come from heaven? Yeah. Now, is Jesus a ventriloquist? Yeah. Was he throwing his voice? Oh, no, this is my son, was no way. No, he is not a ventriloquist. That means Jesus was there in body form, and a voice still boomed from heaven. God can talk audibly. But when God shows himself visibly, it's always Jesus. But they both of them can talk. They both can speak every language. Isn't that incredible? So the living word of God, but also the written word of God. Let's take a look at John chapter 3. Keep your finger here. We're coming back. For he whom God has sent utters the... Words of God. So every time Jesus spoke, it's because he and Jesus, he and God, God and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit have all talked it out. What did they do for the amount of time that they were together prior to the creation? They talked. They communicated. They got along. They had oneness. And so every time Jesus did speak, he spoke the very words of God. So he is the word of God, and what he says is also the Word of God. Now that includes your Bible. Too. But for too many people, when you say the Word of God, they go right away to the Bible. First of all, we need to go right away to Jesus. Because if Jesus is not the center of our faith, we have an op op 
side of faith for out of balance. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter writing says this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When he was revealed and rivaled and rebelled, he did not reveal and rival and rebel in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to the judges justly. And so as he is uh, doing this in, uh, in life, how did he have the strength to do this in life, to not say a word? Take a look at verse number 23. Since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, the word of God is strong enough to stop handle suffering in this world. But the word of God is not a perishable seed, but an imperishable. This world will pass away, as it says in 1 John. But my word will never pass away. Though the, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of the grass, the grass withers and the flowers fail. But the word of God will what? Remain forever. Both aspects. Jesus will not ever stop being the second person in the Trinity. And the Word of God, your Bible, Old Covenant, New Covenant, will always be the Word of God. Now let me just remind us that they're saying that they have this relationship based on a relationship of the Word of God. When we come to church, we might say, we are West Side. But what is it that we are West Side that makes us West Side? The Word of God. And what is the Word of God? For there is one man and one mediator between God and men, and his name is Christ Jesus. The oneness we share in this church is not necessarily because we all like to wear Hawaiian shirts, or we all like to sing the same music list, and we all like to uh, you know, have the fellowships. Those are peripherals. Those are not koinonia. Koinonia means this, I am with you. We have in common. I am with you. What is it that we have in common? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I was reading an excerpt from Warren Wiersbe. Anybody remember Warren Wiersbe? Prolific writer and uh, pastor and preacher of the past. And he said this, that any time Christians are together, somebody should always share Bible. He said, I don't care if it's on the golf course. He said, I don't care if it's walking in at the lunchroom at work. He said that so one thing that we share in common is not just lunch. But how many times does, even when we get together with a Christian brother or sister, it's going to revolve around the meal. I had a person tell me one time, do you want to start a really good Sunday school class? Get a cup of coffee and a donut. I, I've heard people say this about our camp, Silver Spur, that the best thing about Silver Spur is the food. And I keep saying, we don't even need food if we have Jesus Christ. Now, I am glad for the great food. But I hate it when I hear people say that the best thing about our Christian camp is our food. It ought to be our word, the word. And so other relationships, they come together by interests. It can be golfing, it can be electronics, it can be guitars, it can be sports of other kinds, it can be needlepoint, it can be cross-stitching, it can be quilting, it can be homeschool groups. Only the church and Christian relationships come together for no other reason than Christ. But did you know that many churches are segregated? And did you know that some of the greatest hurts does not come from people without, but from people within? And we're going to talk a lot about that over the next couple of weeks. But what does the Word of God, what is it capable of doing? For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide to the difference between bone and marrow and accomplishing its works. That's what it says in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living. That's why somebody can stumble into a hotel room, open up a drawer, find a Gideon Bible, and have a life transformation right there. No preacher, no witness, just the word of God because it is living and it is active. Let me tell you, some other books can stir you up, but only the Bible can save your soul. It's living, it's active, it's powerful. But it's not. Remember I said last week, watch out for the surgeon with the chainsaw. Because it is capable to, to divide the difference between bone and bar. That means insert a blade in such a way that you eliminate 
the, the disease and do not damage either the bone or the marrow. Surgically inserted word of God. Incredible. The basis also is the fellowship of suffering. Let's go back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says in verse number 14, For you brothers became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. And I always like to add in Samaria and to the other most parts of the world. Because all of that's going to be true. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Now, keep your finger here and let's go to 2 Timothy. Remember them, of, or remind them of these things and charge them before God. Do not quarrel about words. Who's he talking to? Paul is writing to who? A pastor. And he is telling the pastor to talk to who? The heathens in the marketplace, right? The Christians in the church. The Christians in the same church. One person might want snakes. Another person might want to lock in. Another person says that there is an expanded version of that video that's about eight or nine minutes longer. Uh, it's worth it's worth watching. Uh, it gets into a little more detail, if you will. But here is a pastor telling another pastor to remind the parishioners that to charge them before God, stop quarreling about words. How many churches uh, have people leave only because one person doesn't interpret the passage the same way as somebody else does? Let me tell you what centers us in this church, Jesus Christ. Somebody might have one view of eschatology, somebody might have another view of eschatology. Guess what? God is still the God of eschatology. That should not separate us. We should not be arguing over words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, of handling rightly the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for will he, he's talking to the church. Irreverent and irrelevant babbler that lead people into more and more ungodliness. Where? In the church. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have severed from the truth. They have cut part. Some versions say swerved. But literally, they did not use their scalpel wisely. And they cut off people, and they cut off themselves. In the church, See, so many times when we think that the Jews made the church suffer in the first century, we've got to realize that it was from their own families and from their own con congregations. As soon as you start to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, there will be suffering. Now, I'm going to go into depth of what this word means and we'll continue to continue. But let's take a look at Philippians 3.10. This is a verse that a lot of people have a lot of difficulty with. Because Paul says this that I may know Christ. Now, your Bible might say that I may know Him, but who do you think the Him is? I, I heard several people say, I do need more of Jesus. Let me just say, we've got all of the Holy Spirit we will ever need. But we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to have resurrection power. What is that? Victory over sin and victory over obstacles. I want to have resurrection power in my life and I may share in his sufferings. Becoming like him even to the point of death. Now this doesn't mean that I start praying, please let me suffer, please let me suffer, please let me suffer. But you know what it also doesn't mean? If in the process of being a real daughter or son of Jesus, if suffering comes my way, amen. Koinonia. I want to be in common with Jesus. And if Jesus experienced certain things for no other reason than he championed the word of God, we should expect similar. That doesn't mean we will, but we should not be surprised. I want to celebrate and fellowship in the resurrection, and that includes sometimes celebrating in the word, there it is, for suffering. And that word literally 
means to experience pain and passion. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean to be hung on a cross. Has anybody ever been belittled verbally because of your faith by a fellow Christian and or a family member? You see, when Paul is saying that we have the fellowship, the koinonia because of Christ, it will also be the source of irritation in the very same people. What does he say in the first Thessalonians 2? From your very own countrymen. That phrase we'll get into a bit. It means your own family. Jesus will say, when you come to me, father will go against son and son will go against father. And mother will go against daughter and daughter will go against mother. Why? For no other reason than because they don't want, because they have been blinded by the God of this world, Satan himself. We have experienced pain and passion from our very own countrymen. Of our same tribe. That's what that phrase means. Of our same tribe, of our same family, of everything like that. Our greatest suffering is inside the community. Now, there are some churches that really love to get together. And you know any of those churches? I mean, they're just looking for an excuse to get together. They love being together. I can tell you about a church that I have a lot of friends on and staff. They can't get the people to go home after church. They, they, they will all of a sudden spontaneously have a potluck in the fellowship hall. And the staff might not even know. All of a sudden he starts seeing people bringing food in. They go, uh, is there, oh, well, you know, a bunch of us just said, instead of going out to the restaurant, we're just going to stay here. They love each other so much, and they really do. I've been at some of their parties. They're spontaneous parties. And all of a sudden, they're just, they, they can't stand to go home. Now, I know some, for some churches, how many of us know that the reason the pastor likes to go to the back is to catch you before you run out? Now, I know many of you have places to go. Many of you go to work. Some of you have other things that you are going to to see other family members. A poncho this week is at a family reunion. He sent me a text saying, I hope it's okay. Yes, it's okay. But we all do sometimes. There have been times Margaret and I had to catch a flight. So we were here and we didn't even, I don't even think we, we left right after uh, the second music. And somebody else preached as we drove to the airport to get on the plane to get back from Margaret's mom's funeral. We all sometimes have to rush off. But one of the signs of a healthy church is when we love to be together. It goes something like this. When's the next fellowship? I think it's next Sunday, is that right? But it goes like this, no, oh, not next Monday. Oh no, not after the second service. Oh, not during the Raider game. Oh, not that. I hope they don't have an ant pudding. Sorry, sir. You know, uh, those kinds of things. <laughs> we suffer. <clears throat> I'm going to say more and more about this suffering in our <clears throat> fellowship over the next few weeks. I just need you to say today, it is real. Now, what is the hindrance? Let's go back. 1 Thessalonians chapter. It says here, beginning in verse number 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove out and displeased God. What, what is the hindrance to the oneness we have in Christ? Satan really thought that if he killed Jesus, it would all be over. Now, wait a second. Really? Do you really think, do you, do you really think that Satan believed that if he killed Jesus, it would all be over? Let me say some, some theologians say yes. Some theologians say no. The ones who say no said, well, I know I couldn't kill Jesus, but I could sure, sure kill his reputation among his followers. And did you know that when Jesus died on the cross, the disciples all ran? And many of the 120 never came back because they were not looking for a God king. They were looking for a political king. They killed Jesus thinking it would be over. Prior to Jesus, they killed the prophets. They killed them in a lot of unusual and wonderful uh, thought-out ways. They would put them, if they, they would not want to just saw somebody in half because that would be grotesque. So they would jam the body into a hollowed out piece of wood, and then they would just cut up the firewood. Isn't that one way to kill people God and provide firewood for your home? You so know that once you talk yourself into being a Jesus killer, and what does that mean? A rejecter of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is not only the second 
second person of the Trinity. Every word in the Bible is about him. So if I'm anti-Bible, it's just like being anti-Christ. And we will come up with some clever ways to try to drive him out. Not only him, but even the church. There is a pastor right now out in the East that is under litigation for failing to do a wedding for an alternative lifestyle family. But they said, oh no, that would never happen. But let me just say, we need to love people who are of the alternative lifestyle. Because we were all alternative to Christ at one time. And so we need to love them into the kingdom. But a pastor should be able to say, based on the word of God, this is what my ethic of my relational theology is, and I will not do that way. But then you've got to be ready to suffer the consequences from the law. And, and that moment we're going to complain about. It. But stand firm. Be ready. The Bible says, makiarios. Uh, what does that word mean if you've been coming on Tuesday nights? How happy is the person who reads and understands the words of these prophets? And it's a, he tries to drive us out. Um, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They killed the prophets. They're trying to drive out the missionaries. And all of this, look at verse number 15, displeases God. Now, if that is true, did you know God could also be pleased? How do we know that? If we were to go to Luke chapter 16, there's a set of series of parables in there. And it says there is more joy in the presence of the angels. Now, many times we forget about that little phrase, in the presence. There is more joy in the angels. But where does the angels get their cue to be joyful? From the person they are in the presence of. And who is that? is pleased when people get saved, when people get baptized, when people stand up for their spiritual values. But when we are killing Jesus, killing the prophets, driving out the spreading of the good news, it displeases God and it opposes mankind. Because every time the world becomes more sacrilegious, what does that mean? Evil? It ruins mankind. Some people would say, oh, what about all the shootings going on in schools today? Uh, probably, it, it didn't used to be that bad. That's right, because we used to respect church. We used to respect God, even if we didn't go. We used to respect Christians, too. I can remember a time when I would walk in. I used to go to a barbershop. And I would walk into the barbershop. Yeah, I know a lot of people think I'm kidding, but I can still grow my hair if I want to. I just choose not to. Is that true? I could have very long hair. I just choose not to. Uh, so I shave it off two or three, four times a week. Uh, sometimes it gets like an eighth of an inch long and I look like a hippie freak. <laughs> <laughs> there were times that I could walk into a barber shop and as soon as I did, the barber would say, hey, wait a second, this is the youth pastor of the church. Everybody, stop your bad words. I didn't ask him. He didn't go to church. It was just a respect for Christians and respect for faith, respect for church. And every time the world tries to kill Jesus, what's that? Eliminate him. Tries to get rid of the prophets. What is that? That's the Old Testament concepts that the Christ is coming. Drives out the New Testament. What's that? Those who deliver the good news, drive out Paul and his, it not only displeases God, but it makes the world in which we live even more evil. It says what? It opposes all of mankind. The word here for opposes means takes it down a notch. Gets it closer to the God. Also means it opposes the Great Commission. If you take a look at John 3.36, it says, for anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. But anyone who does not believe in the Son. Now, who is Jesus talking to in John chapter 3? Anybody remember? Nicodemus, okay. And so he was telling them that a man must be born again, a woman must be born again. And he ends up this little situational uh, conversation by saying this, that if anyone receives the Son, they have eternal life. And for anyone who does not receive the Son, the wrath of God abides upon them all ready. They are already under the condemnation of God. God does not just wait until you take your last breath and say, okay, we are all under the condemnation of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ came to us, died for us, loved us, brought us in, 
We are all under the condemnation of God until we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And as soon as we do, we are no longer, therefore, under any condemnation if we keep Romans 8 put together. But take a look at what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Did you know that the wrath of God is not against a person? It's never against a person. It's what people do. It's what people think. And I'm going to say this. It's what we people refuse to do and refuse to think. And what is that? Jesus is the Christ. It is the, it is the basis of which we are true. Any church that leaves Jesus out stops being God's church. Any church that brings something else in, even if it's not an equal value, it stops being the church. The center focus and the total focus of God's church is Jesus Christ. It goes on to say this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness do what? Suppress the truth. So as the world turns away from God, it turns away from truth. And what did Jesus say? And the truth is the only source that will set us free. We become more in bondage the more we shrink back, drive out, displease, and oppose. Let's continue. Here are the three, uh, the, the three things we've talked about today. The basis of koinonia. What is koinonia? It is getting together with, having in something in common with. It is fellowshipping with. It is participating with. We don't come to church to sit. We come to church to do. Church should be a verb. Unfortunately, we sort of made it a noun. We should do church, not be church. But do you? We shall have fellowship, even if it means suffering. I would never want us to get together on a Tuesday night and just say, okay, who hasn't suffered very much this week? Let's pray that person gets a lot of suffering this week. And as the song said, when things do not go our way and we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I can hear no evil because he is with me. When? Next week, we're going to continue talking about this koinonia called living inside the household of God. Because this is something that we've talked a lot about and we will continue to talk about. The most difficult place to stand up for your faith is in front of your wife and your husband and your kids. So how do we learn how to live inside the family and the household of God? And the next place is become a church and have differences of faith. And then instead of staying in the family, we start divorcing each other and we start adopting ourselves out. Now, I used to tell everybody I was adopted. I still think I was. I couldn't compromise you. But I'll tell you what. Um, from my earliest recollections, everybody around me was dying. Everybody was sick. Everybody was on all kinds of drugs, being rushed to the hospital. And I was healthy. Always healthy. Uh, my brother broke the state record in, uh, what's that, where they throw the big ball? Uh, no, shot put. Broke, broke the state record in shot put. Two different colleges in the high school came to our house and asked him to be on the, on the track team. For no other reason. They said, you don't even have to come to practice. Just come to the meets. And my brother said this, oh, it would interfere with chess club. I know that couldn't have been my DNA. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, I had a very hard time in school. Uh, I, was going, I, I was forced to go through all kinds of psychiatric training and, and testing. Um, I had that, uh, what is that test where you see all the ink blots? Horseshack. Horseshack. 
good scholar, was she? Okay. I had that in first grade without even my parents' knowledge. Because I was telling people things that was going on in my life. Seeing my grandfather dying, seeing my sister dying, seeing my grandmother dying, and seeing my uncle get killed in a car accident. They said, so, this kid's making it all up. He's delusional. In our, in our system of grading, we did not have A, B, C, C. We had ones, twos, threes, and fours. Anybody grow up in that system? In order to make the honor roll, it had to add up a lesson set. So you could get like five ones and a two and still make the honor roll. But you couldn't get straight fours. And up until the time I was in high school, I got straight Ds in every subject. Straight Ds. Couldn't focus. Couldn't think. They would ask me to spell the word, couldn't spell it, still can't. Uh, did you know that the majority of a child's intellect and personality is fully developed by the age of three? With the dreaded connection. And mine was busted. Bad. It was busted. Bad. Uh, to the point when I was in high school, they, would, they didn't want me to take any of the academic classes because they said, this kid will never go to college. They put me in a print shop. They put me in an auto shop. Uh, they put me in three... Uh, study halls. But I did have something. I was an athlete. And so because of that, I, I got to do some things. But I was considered, you know, the kid that you just put in the back row, make them go to school enough amount of days, and when they finally graduate, just give them a certificate of graduation. And get him out of school. Let him go collect But something changed. It, I didn't. I wasn't a good student when I first went to college. I wasn't a good student when I was in the army. And I came home from the army, and all of a sudden I was confronted by a youth pastor. Now I've been sent to church all my life, and I was confronted by a youth pastor. And he said this: When you put a quick plan in church and get saved, because of the wrath. some reason here, God say, what are you mad about? It's true. What are you mad about? It's true. Now, I've had coaches tell me that, and it encouraged me to be a better player. I've had friends tell me that, and it's encouraged me to be a faster brother. And so all of a sudden, I said, wait a second. If all that other time when people were telling me those kinds of things, why is it that I'm so mad about this one, but so motivated by the other? So I looked into it. And I discovered the pastor of life. And Jesus Christ became real. And guess what happened? As I started reading the Bible, other books became easier to read. And other concepts became easier to understand. And the next thing you know, I went from state making straight D's to making straight A's everywhere I went. And people started asking me, why? happened. And the only thing I could say was, Jesus Christ. And then I read this passage where two guys were standing before the Sanhedrin. And they were saying, these are ignorant men. They don't have any letters. Now what that means is they didn't have any bachelors of science or uh, bachelors of arts or masters of theology. These are just ignorant fishermen. And the next phrase is, but they took a notice that they had been with Jesus. Jesus can literally change the way you see and think everything. Now, I'm not going to say that once you become a Christian, you'll get straight A's all the time. But I will say this. Once you really fall in love with Jesus and fall in love with the Word of God and the Word of God, it will make all the other words easier to understand. And the world is well. It's from a personal testimony. I have lived in both worlds. And for the rest of my life, I choose to live in the house. And let's pray. Father, I do want to thank you for today. And thank you for the, the hauntingness of my past. But the brightness of what Jesus did for me. And Lord, maybe there is even someone here today that is 
feeling underappreciated, undereducated, overstressed. But it helped them to know that uh, just by becoming a Christian, they may not become an academia, but other things will start to make sense. That Jesus is not just the foundation of our faith. He is the very center of every relationship, including education. So Lord, this week as we go through the, the different family structure and the work structure and the athletic structures, all called families, may we truly be the family member that says, as for me and my family, we will choose. And may we live in such a way.